Because I get, I'm that person where I'm like, I want my own bed. And I'm out there playing USDGC and walking to my disc thinking like, oh man, you know how nice it'll be to sleep in my bed tonight? You know, like I'm that person. Like I enjoy like the things I have and being home and driving my own car. Like it's things that like make my heart happy and that makes your mental health happy. You know, it's like, it's this whole thing for me of like yeah. doing what I want to do makes my, me compete and play better. to go through that like most the average Joe doesn't think about with touring like what's the thing that consumes most of your time I just think like planning you know like people I think people are like I see this comment a lot whether it's on my post or someone else is like oh you're living the dream uh -huh. it's like okay yeah it's someone's dream until like you have to find a place to stay you have to get a rental car you have to fly you have to deal with delays like I dealt with here you know like you have to wake up at 6 a.m. to get here on like you're like, you read like, it starts to be different than just, we're not in the NBA. You know, we don't get a chartered jet and we stay with our 12 teammates and we drink champagne and then we get off and we have a Rolls Royce pick us up and take us to the hotel that has a suite and we get out of the jacuzzi and go practice in the morning and play the game. Like, it's not like that, you know? And depending on the level of athlete you are in this sport, you might sleep on someone's couch that's too small for you for a week and like eat the dinner that they make. You know, like people don't realize, like, people look at disc golf as, oh, I love disc golf. And like, I would love to do what you're doing, but it's like, it's a big sacrifice. You know, like I'm at the point now where I'm like pretty comfortable in my life. And like, you know, I can kind of travel and do as I please. Five years ago, I, I couldn't have done it the way I'm doing it. Like it, it just wasn't feasible for me, you know? And it, but it's like it's, those same people were just like, oh, you're living the dream. It's like, this is stressful. Like, I have to find a place to stay. I have to find a way to get there. I have to, you know, whoever I'm touring with, maybe, I mean, AB and I tour together. And it's like, we're both like pretty volatile players. And it's like, he could tee off at 8 a.m. and I could tee off at three. So now I have to wake up at 6.30 to get him to the course, come back to the hotel, try to fall asleep. And you know, it's like, people don't realize that, it, it, you know, when you're on a NBA team, you get chartered around. The team takes you to the hotel. You all go to practice together. You all go to the game together. You go to dinner. Like, you know, you're pretty well taken care of with us. It's like. Good luck, fend for yourself. And I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean, this game has offered me so many great opportunities and so much luxury in my life. Like I'm able to make my own schedule. I mean, I could do whatever I want theoretically within reason. And this game has offered me that. I wouldn't trade it for the world at all. But it's like people don't realize like what that entails, you know, and the sacrifice you make. It's just like in the NFL, you know, they didn't wake up and were in the NFL. They worked their butt off, training, working out, you know, catching the ball, running, tackling to get to that point. But once you're there in the MLB or the NFL or the NBA, you're pretty well taken care of. And disc golf, you work your butt off to be 1,030 rated, then you still have to grind. You know, you, there's no like, oh, now you made it, welcome. Like, yeah. no, there's people living in a van still, like using solar power to heat up their food in the microwave. And that's on a disc, I mean, but that's just the truth. You know, it's like there's good disc golfers that choose that lifestyle and that's fine. Every, there's a way to live for everybody. But like the fact that that's still like where we are, you know, people don't realize that. Like right. people, you yeah. know. It's common, it's super common, yeah. that lifestyle. Yeah, James Conrad's a world champion and he chooses to live in his van. So I'm saying, I'm not saying it as a bad thing. Like there's people who are plenty, yeah. James Conrad could probably buy a house in every state if he wanted to, but he chooses to travel with his girlfriend and live in a van. And that's very commendable to me, but like that's still where we are. You know, no, nobody's in the MLB traveling in a van and like sleeping outside the stadium. You know, like it, it's just different. You know, there's a difference between someone who's making 500 grand a year and 5 million a year, you know? You know, and it's like both, I mean, $500,000 a year, you, you have a good living. I mean, yeah. you're living a good life, but like, you know, that extra zero at the end makes a huge difference. You know, and that, I just think that that's like the biggest difference that people don't realize is just like the stress that goes along with what we do. You know, like I wouldn't trade it for the world. Like I'm very happy. I'm very ecstatic of where my life is at, but like, people don't understand like what it takes to like mm -hmm. make it in this sport, I don't think. Yeah, and when you're grinding and somebody's not paying like your salary, it's just like depressing sometimes. Well, think about like, it. Like you just get so... Again, think about the, the dynamic of a $250 entry fee, uh, a $300 hotel stay, you're 550 bucks. You know, you split a rental car, even with four people right now with rental car prices, that's $300, $400 right there. So now you're at what? 1100 bucks yeah 
and, and you haven't played the tournament yet. And you, yeah, and you gotta perform. And now, now you have to go yeah. out there and play and your 10 footer spits out and rolls in the water that costs you three strokes. Now all of a sudden you made $700, you lost $400 for the week and now you have to go do it the next week. You know, it's like, we're at the point still where like the money to get to an event sometimes doesn't make sense. And I think even at my status in this sport and I'm one of the more, thankfully more successful people and I built my own brand and done a lot of things, it still doesn't make sense for me to travel to some tournaments and play. You know, and it's like, if I know the payouts aren't gonna be that great or I don't really enjoy the course or whatever, I skip them because it's like, I'm not comfortable shelling out $1,500. I live in the state of California and I need to fly across the whole country. And then I don't wanna bum rides all week and I don't wanna sleep on someone's couch. So it's like, okay, I go to Ledgestone. I'm probably gonna play pretty good there. This year I made almost $4,000 in the tournament. So my $1,200 a week wasn't that bad of an investment. But like going to Delaware where I'm gonna hit the first tree on every single hole. And if I get 12th place, I get $60. Yeah. It's not for me. Like, yeah. but again, it's a business though. Like I, no yeah. one, we're not obligated to play every single tournament, you know? And if that was the obligation, I, I wouldn't, I would get a different sponsor. You know, like that's part of the reason I would open Vegas. I don't really have anyone breathing down my throat. Alan Barker, who owns Infinite Disc is an absolute stud. Phil Arthur, who owns EV7 is an absolute stud. I mean, they understand like, hey, I'm gonna get hurt. Everyone, you know, like, and I'm not gonna go play with my back feeling like it's gonna fall apart. Like, you know, if I don't like the event, don't play, you know, like, and I kind of made that clear to them. Like, hey, like I'm not, the guy's gonna play 40 tournaments a year anymore. You know, like I, I wanna play the tournaments I wanna play. I wanna go home and rest when I'm not playing and come back. Like, I think I have a good chance of winning the Pro Tour Finals in USDGC. Not for any other reason other than I'm well rested. I'm in a good mental space. I didn't just play tournaments I don't enjoy. I didn't just go play in the rain and slip and hurt my big toe. You know, like there's a lot of things that I feel like go into playing well in this game. and. Look at, <clears throat> excuse me, look at Paul Macbeth. I mean, he's slowed down throughout the years a lot and maybe his play hasn't gotten better, but like he feels more recharged, I'm sure. He's spending more time with his wife, spending more time with his dog, building a course. Like he's doing other things that make him happy versus just like, I'm a disc golf robot, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I keep bringing up Federer, but he's, you know, poster boy for that in tennis. He just like, as he got older, he just started cutting back and he had the ability you know, to do that because he had enough money coming in. And then he would still, I mean, 2017, take six months off before 2017, come and win the Australian Open. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, like it, dude, that's just crazy. There's something to that, you yeah. know? Like, if you're in an individual sport, obviously you're not a team, you can't just leave your team. Right, You right. know, if, if you're in an individual sport <clears throat> and there's 40 tournaments a year as a professional disc golfer I can play, and I play 25 of them, and I'm like, oh man, I'm, last end of the season, you're tired, you start hating disc golf, you're like, oh man, I haven't slept in my bed in four months. You're not gonna play as good. Like, I wanna come to these two tournaments. These, these tournaments you win, these are it's life changing as a disc golfer. You, know, you win the Pro Tour Finals on ESPN, you're the man. Yeah. You win the USDGC, you're the man. Like, I wanna come here and have the best chance. And, and maybe people think, oh, well, you're not playing right before isn't good. Like, no, I feel recharged. Like by the time the tournament starts in two weeks, I'll be ready to play and I'll be out there grinding. And again, I'm not, I've never acted like I'm some super winner. You know, like that's not, I, I'm consistent and I am very good, but like, I'm not expecting to come to USCGC and win, but I think I have a much better chance of winning with the way I've prepared than I would if I had just played 40 tournaments in a row. Because I get, I'm that person where I'm like, I want my own bed and I'm out there playing USCGC and walking to my disc thinking like, oh man, you know how nice I'll be to sleep in my bed tonight. You know, like I'm that person. Like. I enjoy like the things I have and being home and driving my own car. Like it's things that like make my heart happy and that makes your mental health happy. You know, it's like, it's this whole thing for me of like yeah. doing what I want to do makes my, me compete and play better. The weeks I don't do good, like Maple Hill I got 40th and Vermont I got 70, whatever, missed the cut. But like I wasn't in the right like mental spot. Like we were working on my contracts. I was with my agent. Like we were doing a lot of things that like weren't just disc golf. You know, like, so it's different for me because I, like here, my, I have the same guy that's caddied for me every single USCDC I've ever played. He's one of my best friends. I was the best man at his wedding at home. Like, it's his birthday week. Like, this is like our trip. But like at night, we don't go drink milkshakes. We go putt. In the morning, he wakes me up and says, let's go practice. And, oh, eat lunch and let's go practice again. And at nine o'clock at night, we go putt for 30 minutes. Like, he, he takes pride in like this event and we've never done good. And it's not a lack of trying. It's not a lack of effort. It's not a lack of me listening it's a lack of just like getting around that course it's very hard but like this week like we both take a lot of like we talk about this week like 
all year. Like if I get fifth place and we're on the airport going home, we're gonna be talking about next year's like game plan. Like that's just how we like, we take this turn up very serious. And so at some point, I really do believe in my heart, I'll win the USCDC. Whether it's when I'm 40, like Nate Sexton, you know, not, he didn't win at 40, but whether it's a later part of my career and I'm out there playing safe, <clears throat> or it's this year when I'm playing aggressive, I think I have a really good chance of winning that event. I think my throwing skills and putting skills are, when they're on, are as good as anybody's. And I think that I have someone on my bag that really cares, yeah. you know? So if there's a time for me to succeed, it, it would be this week. You know, like I said, Maple Hill, Green Mountain, I had someone on my bag that really cares. Steven was one of my best friends, my agent, my manager, everything, but we were talking and focused on other stuff. You know, and it's stuff that needs to be imperative for the rest of my career. You know, and things that we needed to work on, needed to talk about, needed to figure it out. But like, it's hard to go out there and play when you're thinking about a hundred different things. At least for me, maybe my brain's this big and I can't do a couple of things at once. But like, you know, we talk about something at 10 a.m. over breakfast and I see off at two, that thing is gonna pop back in my head. You know, when I'm with Ben and we're at USCDC, it's like eat, disc golf, play, practice, don't suck make more putts, do good, you know, th don't throw it out of bounds. What's the game plan? You know, like he, he's taking notes on like the wind during our practice rounds, like what disc I throw. Yeah. And he'll check the wind and make, oh, hey, the wind's doing this different, like throw your more stable disc, like stuff I, I might not think about, but in that moment can help you win. You know, J the year James Conrad won, he won at 20 under par. I was 21 under par with a round and a half left to play and lost the tournament. If I would have parred out the last 27 holes, I would have won the tournament by one. It's easy to say, it, trust me, easy to say. Yeah. But I eagled hole 10, so I had whatever, 26 holes to play and I was at 21 under par. Uh -huh. James Conner had won at 20 or 19 under par. Yeah. Obviously if we would've known no oh, par out, like, but we kept, the game plan was be aggressive, yeah. you know? But like, you never knew, like I would've thought, like even at that time, I wasn't, I wasn't winning, you know? So it's not like I thought like, oh, if I just keep doing this, I'm gonna keep winning. Like I just kept playing, but like, you know, that's the thing about golf sports is you don't know what's gonna happen until it happens, you know? Yeah. And it was easy for Ben and I to sit in the hotel after the round and go, damn, you're crying, like, bro, like, we lost. Like, that was the first year I really felt like I could have won the tournament. Yeah. Like, there was other years where I'd shot a hot round or I'd played well, or I'd been on the first card, second card, like, but that year I really felt like this is like, I gave it away. And like, obviously I didn't, like the, I, after around, yeah. the end of round three, I was out of it. Like I couldn't have won anyways. You know, I, I had went triple bogey. I had a really bad finish that day, which took me out of it. But like, that was the year where it's like, man, like we keep our heads screwed on and like, this is our tournament, you know, going forward, you know? Yeah. And I'm never the person where I look back at the tournament and go, oh, I should have won. Yeah. But like that tournament, we both were like, man, like, I could've won. Yeah, like this was the year that like, if you just keep your head bolted on straight and you don't try to be so aggressive that you, yeah. you know, you win, you know, but plenty more years, plenty more events. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because at 27 holes, you don't like, obviously your game plan up to that point was working. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, So it's like, you can't change that. I would, and I would have like, never, you could put me in that situation again. And if you, I don't know 21 is gonna win, I'm gonna play the holes the exact same. Yeah. And I'm a pretty aggressive player anyways, yeah. you know? So like, I'm gonna go to USC to see and pitch around like, I don't have a sidearm, so US, I can't pitch around at USCDC because I'll get out of position where you have to throw a sidearm, and then what? Now I'm double screwed. So, you know, disc golf is a game of obviously like misses. You know, golf is a game of misses. You know, whoever yeah. misses the best is the one that wins. Yeah, whoever just sucks left. Yeah. Less. You know, that's the, that's the that truth. Thing. And it's like, yeah. you know, look at the James Conrad, Paul and Beth battle at the Worlds. Yeah. They both made mistakes, but coming down the stretch, that was the most insane disc golf I've ever seen. I mean, it, it was compared, I mean, not comparative, obviously, they, someone won the world championship, I just won the Portland Open, but Eagle and I, watch that back nine at Portland Open. I mean, back in birdie, 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 birdie. I mean, I think I shot back-to-back -back course records to win the tournament, but like, you, you, gotta, do, you gotta do good now. Yeah. You know I mean? Disc golf, it, it, it's no longer just like, we're out here playing, like, yeah. this is a real thing, and like, winning these tournaments changes your, your life, you know? Yeah, yeah. And like with Paul and James, it's not like Paul even made a mistake. No, he did the right thing. Like he played the last couple holes. Uh -huh. How you would coach someone to play them. If that's a video game, you do exactly what Paul did. Yeah. Paul Paul did nothing wrong. Right. And people say, I mean, he was in good position to go for the green, but why? Why? There's no point. Yeah. yeah. So the risk again, if I was in Paul's shoes, I would have taken the loss too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing you, you can, I mean, the dude, James Conrad threw the greatest shot disc golf's ever seen. <coughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so clutch. Probably one out of a hundred. And then under a that hundred? pressure, maybe more. Well, no, if he sat there and tried one out of a hundred, no pressure, maybe. No. One out of 500, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Now you add pressure of a world championship, one out of 100,000, maybe. Yeah. And that happened to be that moment he did both. Yeah. But again, it, it's a... Uh, that just shows how determined that man is. I mean, James Carter, he's been great for a long time now, but like that shows like the no quit. It's easy to quit right there when best player in the world just lays up to hundred feet and you think I have to throw this in, like it's over. Yeah. Like that, that right there taught me a lot. Cause there's definitely times where I'm playing and I'm like, man, eh, kind of screw it, whatever. I'm six back. Adewad, for example, I, the, they go into the second round, I shot like six under the first round. I'm like, man, like I lost the tournament already. This is dumb. And then Paul Johnson, who owns T-Box Disc Golf, Caddy, he's one of my best friends. We were playing hole 12 of the last round. He goes, oh, you're five behind. I said, five behind who? He goes, Macbeth. I said, I'm going to win the tournament. He's like, what? I'm like, I'm going to win the tournament. And he like laughed at me. And I'm like, you think I'm kidding? Like, we didn't speak another word to each other. I birdied five of the last six holes of the eagle and lost the tournament by one. But like, I just, I just told him like, I'm winning. Like, uh, but I like had quit on myself earlier in the tournament, you know, like, and it's like, you look back at that and it's like, okay, you lose by one. If your attitude didn't suck for 17 holes of one round, maybe you, you know, you would have, I would have won by five, but also maybe I wouldn't have gotten that zone and went six down for six holes. You know, it's like one of those things you don't know until you know, you know, you just never quit. You just keep grinding and throwing and grinding and throwing until there's no more holes to be thrown. Yeah.